Tonight's debate, we are very privileged to have Zakir Hussain and of the Muslim Debate Initiative and Richard Lucas of Solas debating the question, who was Jesus? Um, if you enjoy this, or, and if you're free tomorrow night, they're doing another debate in Blackburn on the one true religion, Christianity or Islam, and there are some flyers outside. Um, this event is organised by the SOLAS Centre for Public Christianity and really what SOLAS is all about is putting on lots of different kind of public engagement type events and a whole host of topics and so if you do enjoy this debate, if you're interested in finding out about other debates we're putting on in the future, we do have a stall out in the foyer and if you want to put an email address down we'll email you about upcoming events. There's also a book stall there you might be interested in and um, you can chat to any of us from Solas. If you have an idea for an event that you'd like to see in the future, let us know if, and we can see what we can do. But we do try to put on maybe three, four big debate type events a year in Edinburgh, so do let us know. Um, as I said, we're very pleased to have here tonight um, our two speakers and also Mr Will Clayton, who's going to be chairing the debate. He really is going to be firm and take charge and, <laughs> and control everything. So it's great to have them. And I don't really want to hold us up any longer, so I think that's everything I had, so I'll just let Will take charge. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, as we've already heard, the motion tonight is Who is Jesus? And we have two speakers. To my right, Mr. Lu Richard Lucas writes, speaks, and debates regularly for the Solar Centre for Public Christianity. His areas of particular interest include biblical ethics, Islam, intelligent design, sexual morality, and politics. He's a member of the King's Church in Edinburgh. To my left, Mr. Zakir Hussain is a Muslim researcher and speaker who is part of the Muslim Debate Initiative, MDI UK. He is interested in comparative religion and has researched many with a special interest in Judaism and Christianity. He has debated notable figures like Dr. James White and Reverend Samuel Green. He is currently involved in organising interfaith dialogues to promote better understanding the city of Birmingham where he resides. Each speaker will make a 20-minute opening speech followed by two rebuttal speeches, the first of which will be six minutes, the second of which will be four minutes. Following that initial hour of speeches, we will then have the opportunity for about 40 minutes of questions from the audience, with the opportunity for both speakers to answer your questions and engage in a debate. Following that session, we will then have a closing statement of two minutes from each speaker. So without any further ado, I'd now like to welcome Mr. Richard Lucas to the lectern. Well, thank you very much. Can I extend my welcome to this evening's debate as well? Thanks very much to Edinburgh Elim Church for hosting this. Thanks for coming along. Thanks to the chairman, the, uh, the technical crew, and um, a really big thank you for, to Zakia for coming all the way from Birmingham. Um, I was at university in Birmingham for a few years, a great place to live, really enjoyed it. Um, Muslim debaters in Scotland seem a bit thin on the ground, so it's really good that Zakia has been able to, um, to make the journey to join us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I watch these mainstream media, there's often discussion about Islam, and there's discussion about Christianity, but it's rarely about the heart of the matter. It's about peripheral issues. It's about more contemporary issues. It's not about the issues at the heart of these two faiths. And I'm really glad tonight that that's what we are going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about things at the heart of Christianity and at the heart of Islam. So then that's the, the question, who is Jesus, takes us there. Now, tonight's debate is between two views. It's between the view of Jesus presented in the New Testament and the view of Jesus that's presented in the Quran. Now this evening, I'll be presenting to you a case why the New Testament is the best source of evidence about Jesus, and I'll explain what the New Testament has to say about him. As a Muslim, Zakir believes that the Quran is the best source of information about Jesus, and he believes what it says about him. Because Muslims believe that Allah dictated every word of the Quran directly to Muhammad. So why do I turn to the New Testament to find out about Jesus? The reason is that it's a good historical source. No other historical source comes close to it in terms of reliability and credibility. The New Testament documents were written early. They were written very soon after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The books in the New Testament were put into their final written forms in between the late 40s AD and at the latest, the 90s AD. So the first ones were written within 20 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. 
Now, it wasn't just a case that 20 years later, some of Jesus' followers sat down to see what they, what they could remember about what happened 20 years ago. Right from the time of Jesus' life, throughout until the Gospels were written, the story circulated among their followers. They gained new followers. They wanted to tell them about Jesus. So the story circulated among Jesus' followers. That was the way uh, information was dealt with mainly in those days. It was an oral society. And things could be transmitted very reliably in that way. When the Gospels were finally committed to, uh, to written form, that was still among Jesus' circle of family, friends, and followers. And they formalized this oral tradition into written documents. The Gospels we have in the New Testament, they're all either written by eyewitnesses or based closely on eyewitness testimony. And they were written at a time while the eyewitnesses were still alive to review what was being written down. So these first followers of Jesus, wanting to preserve their experience of Jesus, wanted to record the, a record of his deeds and actions and his words. What did they report? What do they have to say about Jesus? Well, I'm going to start off with a reading from Mark's Gospel. Uh, this is uh, when Jesus is on trial. The high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Now that story was from Mark's gospel, which, which many people believe was the first gospel uh, to be written. Now there's two things I'd like to pick up on from that uh, passage. First of all, Jesus described himself as the Son of God, the Son of God. Also, in Mark's gospel, God describes Jesus as the Son of God at his baptism and at the transfiguration. And the corollary of that is Jesus describes his Father in heaven, calls him Abba, an intimate term for fatherhood. And again, that was unprecedented in the Judaism of the time. So this was a unique relationship that Jesus was conveying, um, son and fathership with God. The second phrase from the passage I read was that Jesus described himself as the son of man. Now that might sound quite an innocuous phrase. It might just sound like a term for a human. And it can be that. But the son of man was understood in a very particular way to the Jews of the time. And it was understood as a reference to a vision recorded in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 7. And this is what it says. It says, In my vision at night I looked, and there was before me one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this son of man was worshipped. Now if the Jews were clear about anything, they were clear that you only worship God. But the son of man was worshipped. The phrases used to describe the, the son of man, all nations and peoples, every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, etc. Those phrases are also used in the same vision in Daniel to describe, uh, they're applied to God as well. So it's taking phrases applied to God and applying them to the Son of Man. And that phrase, there's still the Ancient of Days, but there's a separate figure called the Son of Man. And they both have the descriptions that fit God applied to them. So this God-Man figure, the Son of Man who shares in God's identity, is what Jesus was referring to when he again and again and again referred to himself as the Son of Man. No wonder he was accused of blasphemy when he made those statements. But the third thing to look at from the New Testament is uh, when prophets spoke in Judaism of the time, they would say, thus saith the Lord, and they would read from the Old, Old Testament, um, conveying God's message to the people. But when Jesus spoke, he said something different. He would start with things written in the Old Testament and then say, not say this is what God says. He would then say, but I say. And they would often prefix his statements uh, with the word amen, which is translated often as verily, verily, or truly I say to you. Now that phrase was normally used as a prefix to stating what God had said. And that's why people responded to Jesus with statements like this. What is this? A new teaching with authority. Jesus spoke in a way that implied 
that his words were God's words. Number four, the New Testament records Jesus' miracles, and sources outside the New Testament report Jesus' reputation as a miracle worker. And these miracles were worked through the power of the God that Jesus called Father. Right, number five. In the New Testament, we hear that Jesus declared sins forgiven. But in Judaism, only God could declare sins forgiven. That was a divine prerogative. So if we read from Mark chapter 2, again, notes from Mark's gospel I'm reading from. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Number six, of course, the New Testament records Jesus' death and resurrection. And Jesus' resurrection was the ultimate affirmation by God on his life and teaching. After Jesus' uh, resurrection, he was even more explicit about his divinity, and that became clearer to his followers. In Matthew 28, Jesus said this, said, "All, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All authority in heaven and earth, that belongs to God. That can only belong to God. So Jesus is associating himself with that authority that is God's alone. At the end, it's not baptizing them in the name of God. It's baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the first Christians at the time worshipped Jesus and he accepted that worship. Now I could go on with other themes from the New Testament um, that point in the same direction. But to conclude... Jesus and God in the New Testament are shown to be somehow one. Jesus is divine. God's not a simple unity, but includes the Father in heaven and Jesus the Son. Jesus was God in human form. Now, some people suggest that this idea developed over decades, over centuries in the early church. If you look at the, the, the writings in the New Testament, that's not the case. Because the New Testament writings came thick and fast. But every single book in the New Testament gives the same picture of Jesus as being divine. There was no controversy over this issue among the early Christians that we have any uh, record of. It was, um, it was the belief that was accepted from the very beginning of the church. Now in the New Testament, the earliest writings in the New Testament, many think were actually by the Apostle Paul. So I'm just going to have a look at some of the things that he had to say about Jesus as well, as samples of what the very first Christians believed. Now, Paul took passages from the Old Testament that referred to Yahweh, to the God of Israel, and he used them, and instead of Yahweh, he put in Lord for Lord Jesus Christ. So he put Jesus in the place of God in Old Testament teaching. The word he used when he said Jesus as Lord was kurios. The Greek word that was used in the New Testament of the, of the Old Testament of the time as a substitute for divine name, Yahweh. So when Paul said that Jesus was given the name above every name, that means that Jesus shared in the name of Yahweh, the name of God. Also in Paul's writings, we see that the early Christians prayed to Jesus. At the end of 1 Corinthians 15, there's a famous little line that includes the, the word Maranatha, which means, come Lord. It was a prayer to Jesus. It's an Aramaic word. The reason Paul didn't translate it into Greek along with the rest of the letter was because people must have been familiar with it. It must have been a common prayer in the early church and Paul's quoting it in the form that was already familiar to people. Also in the New Testament, particularly in Paul's letters, we find extracts that are thought to be early Christian hymns that were well known to the early Christians so Paul can quote them and appeal to something that they're already aware of. And those hymns are about Jesus, but they're also sung to Jesus as an act of worship. Um, Some writers outside of Christianity as well referred to that. They said these Christians sing hymns in worship to Christ. Now these first Christians, they were still monotheists. They utterly rejected the idea of worshipping idols. They would be horrified at the idea of worshipping another god. But Jesus was given the sort of devotion that was reserved for God in, among devout Jews. 
they maintain their monotheism, not by, an, not by adding Jesus to Yahweh, but by including Jesus in this divine uniqueness. So overall from the New Testament, who was Jesus? The unique son of God, who shared in God's identity, God in human form. That was believed by the first followers, and they were willing to die for those beliefs in the decades to come. Now notice what I've said there. It didn't depend on me assuming that the Gospels are inspired by God or have any special spiritual status. I believe they are. I could, could have argued that case. But for tonight, I'm, tonight, I'm happy to approach them just as historical documents written at the time that are a reliable account of Jesus' life uh, and work and words. Right, and now move on to the Quran, our alternative source of information about Jesus. The Quran was written 600 years later uh, by an Arab named Muhammad, uh, who claimed to be receiving revelations uh, from God. And according to Muslims, these revelations to Muhammad are what we now have written down in the Quran. Now, the Quran has no historical credibility with regard to Jesus' life on earth, having been written so late in such an isolated location. So a fundamental question for tonight's debate is this. Which source do you trust? Here are the cho two choices. A, accounts from within the circle of eyewitnesses, friends and family of Jesus that were formalized within 20 to 40 years of Jesus' death. Or B, writings made hundreds of miles away in Arabia 600 years later among people who couldn't even have read the original reports. My answer to that question is A, Zakia must answer that question B. When the Quran was written, there was no translation of the Gospels into Arabic, so Muhammad got what knowledge he had of Jesus from the few local Christians that he met, and they were far from the centers of the Christian faith, and their understanding of Christianity uh, was often quite patchy um, uh, and some inconsistencies in it. In his early ministry, Muhammad hoped the Jews and Christians would endorse his prophethood, but they didn't. And as Muhammad's uh, prophecies went on, they became more and more critical of Jews and Christians, and he began to rewrite biblical stories differently, changing them, partly through his patchy knowledge of the biblical accounts, and partly to fit in with his own developing Islamic theology. If Muhammad wanted to present himself as God's most significant prophet, then Jesus needed downgrading. But I'd like to have a look a little bit about the Quran's track record of dealing with uh, biblical stories. And I'll start with just a couple of illustrations from the Old Testament. Right, the first one, when the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Quran reports that God lifted Mount Sinai, held it above the heads of the Israelites, and then put it back in its place. Now, the accounts we have in the Bible and Exodus, obviously that's not recorded. That doesn't sound to me like the sort of thing people might have omitted from their account. That sounds quite a dramatic incident. So how on earth has that got into the Quran? How, how did that story end up in the Quran? Well, we know where that story came from. That story uh, was made up uh, as part of Jewish folklore in the intervening centuries. So that was a pre-existing story that someone had made up, was written down, and it's now in the Quran. Why is that in the Quran? Okay, number two, the, uh, the Quran rewrites the story of Abraham. There's quite a bit to that. I'll just give you a few, a few um, aspects of it. The Quran says that Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the Kaaba. Now, the Kaaba is the black cube at the center of Islamic worship uh, in Mecca. There's no record of that anywhere outside the, the Quran, no historical record of that. But then uh, Muhammad said that that had happened. Uh, Muhammad changed the, the Quran changes the story about Abraham being instructed by God to sacrifice Isaac. The Quran changes it and says that Abraham was actually instructed to sacrifice Ishmael. Now, you may know many Muslims believe uh, that Ishmael was the father of the Arabic race. Muhammad changed the story uh, to, to reflect that. Now, looking at those stories, there was no previous record of them. You can either believe that God revealed those things to Muhammad in um, the seventh century, or you could believe that they seem to have been created with a purpose of backing up um, Islamic theology and supporting uh, the views that Muhammad was trying to promote. Let's move on to the New Testament. Uh, now, when Mary, the Jesus, uh, mother of Jesus, is introduced 
in the Quran. She's described as the sister of Aaron. Now, the sister of Aaron was called Miriam and obviously lived 1,400 years earlier, which just seems a clear mistake. Now, Muhammad didn't have access to written records of the Bible. He just picked up things from local Christians. It's quite understandable uh, that he might have got mixed up uh, like that. I'm quite willing to accept that. In the Quran, we also find this story. Uh, the baby Jesus speaks from the cradle as a baby and says this, according to the Quran. I am indeed a servant of Allah. He's given me the book and appointed me a prophet. He's made me blessed wherever I may be and has enjoined upon me prayer and almsgiving. Right, the idea of Jesus teaching from, uh, speaking from the cradle, that's not in any of the Gospels. That's not mentioned in any of the, uh, of the accounts from the time. Where does that come from? How did that in get into the Quran? Well, there was a document called the Arab Infancy Gospel, written in the 5th or 6th century. And so written before, you know, well before the time of Muhammad um, in Arabic. And that included a story of Jesus speaking from the cradle. So it's quite plausible that Muhammad could have come across that story. And then we find it in the Quran. The story slightly changed in the Quran. The original story, Jesus didn't say, I'm a servant of Allah. Jesus said, I am Jesus, the Son of God, the Logos, who you have brought forth as the angel Gabriel announced to you. And my Father has sent me for the salvation of the world. But perhaps that didn't fit uh, with Muhammad's purposes. Now, if you look at what Jesus is proposed to have said in the Quran, it's clearly a reflection of Islamic theology. And the prayer and almsgiving, the words used, that's reflecting uh, what are known to today as two of the pillars uh, of Islam. It also said that Jesus was given a book. Now, the Quran constantly misunderstands Jesus' purpose, as though his mission was to come and bring a book, and that book is called the Gospel. But obviously, that wasn't what Jesus' mission was at all. Jesus didn't write a book. Uh, but Muhammad projects his own understanding of prophethood onto Jesus. That's another one from the Quran. It says, the child Jesus making clay birds that then come to life and fly off. Wherever did that story from, come from? No records of that in the New Testament or in the early centuries. Well, it comes from the infancy gospel of Thomas. Many scholars think the infancy gospel of Thomas was written many centuries after Jesus and was basically a children's storybook. Uh, as we might have a children's Bible now with some embellishments. It's a document that has no credibility uh, whatsoever. How does that story end up in the Quran? In the Quran, it claims that Jesus' disciples call themselves Muslims. The Quran claims that Jesus prophesied the coming of Muhammad. The Quran claims that Jesus wasn't crucified or killed uh, by the Jews. Now, on the other hand, the Quran agrees with the New Testament on many points. So I'd assume that Zacchaeus believes that Jesus uh, came uh, through a virgin birth. Was, uh, yes, okay. Um, right, to, just to finish, to finish up, the, um, the Quran contradicts the New Testament, left, right, and center. But a big problem the Quran has is it says, if you want to check the veracity of the Quran, check it by checking it against the New Testament. Let the people of the gospel judge by that which Allah has revealed therein. So on the one hand, it's contradicting the New Testament. On the other hand, it's saying go to the New Testament to confirm the Quran. And how are Muslims going to reconcile that contradiction? The way they reconcile it in general is to try and undermine the reliability of the New Testament to the point where they can pick out the bits that agree with what's in the Quran, undermine the bits that don't agree with the Quran, whereas what's really happening is they're taking what's in the Quran, taking that to be absolute, the absolute truth, and then interpreting the Bible in the light of that, discarding bits that don't fit, keeping bits uh, that do fit. Now, I think the only way Zakir can really win the debate tonight is if he can persuade us that the Quran is indeed a revelation from God. And if he can persuade us of that, then that overrules all of these objections. So I'm looking forward to hearing Zakir's case that the Quran is indeed a revelation from God. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Mr. Zaki Hussein. I'd firstly like to praise the one and only true God of Abraham. Blessed is he. The one who the Jews refer to as Adonai Elohim and who the Muslims refer to as Allah Azawajal, 
Secondly, I would like to pray that his peace and guidance is with us all here tonight. I'd also like to thank Richard for inviting me here tonight and for giving me the opportunity to give the Islamic perspective on a question that's been asked for over 2,000 years now. This question is, who was Jesus? I would like to attempt to answer this question by breaking my opening statement into five parts. Number one, what the Quran says regarding who Jesus was. Number two, why should any Christian care what the Quran has to say on this matter? Number three, what are the main reasons for our difference of opinion regarding Jesus? Number four, who did Jesus think he was and who did his immediate followers and people around him think he was? Number five, clear-cut proof that Jesus is not God. So let me start with point number one. The Quran affirms many things that are found in the four Gospels. So many of the things that it has to say Christians would agree to and have no issue with, such as Surah 347, that Jesus was born of a virgin, as Richard pointed out. Surah 349, that he was a prophet for Israel and that he did many mighty miracles by the permission of God. Surah 685, that Jesus is amongst the ranks of the righteous. Surah 287, that he was strengthened with miracles. Surah 546, that he confirmed the laws of the Torah which is confirmed in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. The Quran also mentions in Surah 3, Ayah 45, that he is the Messiah. And in Surah 3, Ayah 42, that his mother Mary is amongst the greatest women of all time. Now the Quran in Surah 19, Ayah 30, also mentions how Jesus defended his mother from the cradle by being granted the ability to speak as a baby, which Richard pointed out. There are some hints of the story preserved in the infancy gospel that some Christians took as scripture. Now can you imagine when Mary, who was not married at the time, turned up in front of her community with a baby in her hand? Would they believe her if she said, I just heard voices and miraculously became pregnant? No, they wouldn't. Just imagine if your daughter came home one day who wasn't married with a baby in her hand. Would you believe her if she told you it was a miracle? The answer is no. So what stopped the Jews from stoning her to death? as an adulterous woman, according to the Torah. The Quran seems to show that Mary was vindicated from the charge of being an unchaste woman by this miracle, and the Quran also defends Mary from the charge of fornication in Surah 4, Ayah 156. I would be interested in knowing the explanation that Christians give for why the Jews did not stone Mary to death under Jewish law, so I hope Richard can share his thoughts on this, please. In Surah 3, Ayah 51, it claims that Jesus preached the message of Tawheed, which in essence is that God is one, uniquely one, one person. In Surah 5, Ayah 116, God speaks about the day of judgment, where Jesus will be asked in front of everybody if he ever claimed divinity, to which Jesus will reply, no. So according to the Quran, Jesus never claimed to be God. So I've given you a basic picture of what the Quran has to say, regarding who Jesus is, so I will now move on to my second point, which is, why should any Christian consider what the Quran has to say about Jesus? Many Christian missionaries sometimes say, why should we believe a book written 600 years later in a different language and in a different country? Although I must point out that they believe in books also written in a different language, namely Greek, whereas Jesus spoke Aramaic slash Hebrew, and these gospels were also written in different countries, such as Rome, the Gospel of Mark, for example. One of the reasons Christians should accept the Quran is because the Bible commands you to. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse number 18, God speaks about raising a prophet from the brethren of the Israelites who will be like Moses, and he will also be a mouthpiece for God. And any person who does not listen to this prophet will be destroyed. This prophecy was not fulfilled before Jesus, as the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament confirm. Moreover, Jesus cannot be this prophet as Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse number 10 says, And there shall never arise again in Israel a prophet like unto Moses. And since Jesus was from amongst Israel, he is ruled out. Moreover, Jesus himself said that this prophet will come after him. And John chapter 14, 15 and 16, Jesus speaks of someone to come after him who will testify to who he is. If you read the text carefully, you can see that this person is in fact the prophet like Moses who shall speak what he hears and shall be told what to say, which doesn't sound like a Holy Ghost is 100% God. Christians claim this text is regarding the Holy Ghost, but it's clear that it's not the Holy Ghost. Also, did the Holy Ghost guide Christians into all truth and testify regarding Jesus, 
The answer is no, as any book on church history shows that Christians were at each other's throats for centuries upon centuries trying to figure out things like, was Jesus just a man? Or was he just God? Or was he both? Was he the father or was he a separate person? Was he subordinate to the father or was he co-equal? And the list goes on. And I've got church father quotes to confirm that. Whereas when the Quran was revealed, it gave a clear, concise and coherent picture of who Jesus was. And Muslims are agreed across the board. We didn't argue with each other for centuries trying to figure out who Jesus is, like the Christians. Another reason why you should accept what the Quran has to say on the matter is that modern biblical scholarship seems to understand Jesus as being closer to the image that Islam portrays as opposed to Christianity. Scholars such as E.P. Sanders and Geza Vermis confirm that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet who never claimed divinity. Bar Ehrman on page 60 of his book called Forged writes the following, Many scholars have thought of the early church as seriously divided. On one side were the Jewish followers of Jesus, such as his brother James, who was head of the church in Jerusalem, and a disciple Peter. On the other side were people like the Apostle Paul, who you Christians follow, who focus on converting Gentiles. In this modern Shema, James and Peter are often taught to be more true to Jesus' original message, that it was the God of Israel who had brought salvation to those who kept his teachings as found in the Jewish law. For these early Christians, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish law. So they didn't believe he was God. I will now move on to my third point regarding why there are differences regarding who Jesus is. The Quran gives a simple reason in Surah 4, Ayah 171, where it commands the Jews and Christians, in this um, case um, regarding exaggerating about Jesus, it tells the Jews and Christians not to exaggerate regarding Jesus. So Islam claims that the reason why Christians believe Jesus is God is due to centuries of exaggeration by his followers. The question is, when did this exaggeration start? I'm going to leave Paul aside for a moment, and I might touch up on him in the rebuttals, but I'm going to stick to the Gospels for now. Biblical scholarship mentions that Mark was the first Gospel to be written around the year 70 CE, with Matthew and Luke copying from Mark and changing things to improve the image of Jesus around the years 80 to 85 CE. So they couldn't have been disciples if they had to copy from Mark, who was not a disciple. And the Gospel of John was written between 90 CE to 110 CE. It's amazing that if one moves from Mark, the earliest Gospel in the New Testament, to John, the last to be written, one can see a clear evolution in the image of Jesus. For example, noted biblical scholar William Barclay, in his book Daily Bible Studies on the Gospel of Matthew, page 2, says the following, and I quote, Since Matthew and Luke are much longer than Mark, it might just possibly be suggested that Mark is a summary of Matthew and Luke, but there is one other set of facts which show that Mark is earlier. It is the custom of Matthew and Luke to improve and polish Mark. So Matthew and Luke improved the word of God. If we may put it so, let us take some instances. Sometimes Mark seems to limit the power of Jesus. At least an ill-disposed critic might try to prove that he was doing so. So I must be the ill-disposed critic tonight. Let us see some examples of improvements or changes in the image of Jesus. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, regarding Jesus doing miracles, it says, And he could do no mighty work there, and he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus couldn't do a miracle uh, because of the people's unbelief. But the same story in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58 says, And he did not do many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. So in Mark, he couldn't do it. In Matthew who improved on Mark, he didn't do it, so he could have if he wanted to, but he chose not to. William Barclay says, Matthew shrinks from saying that Jesus could not do any mighty works and changes the form of expression accordingly. So Matthew had an issue with the fact that Jesus wasn't all powerful, so he changed the text. And you can all read Mark chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, and compare it with Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. Here's another example. In Mark chapter 10, a man walked up to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But if you go to the same story in Matthew chapter 19, instead of Jesus saying, why do you call me good? Instead he says, why do you ask me about what is good? So we see that once again, Matthew was embarrassed by the statement of Jesus when he denied that he was ultimately good as God is, thus he cannot be God. 
What about Mark chapter 5, verse 30? As Jesus was walking, a woman comes behind him who's been bleeding for 12 years, and she touches Jesus and she's healed. So Jesus turns around because he noticed power had left him, and he starts asking his disciples, who touched me? Who touched me? And they said to him, we don't know who touched you. There's a whole crowd around you. So Jesus is looking around trying to figure out who touched him, and then the woman tells him, it was me who touched you. Now, the same story in Matthew chapter 9, rather than looking around all confused and ignorant, uh, where is, uh, who touched me? Instead, Jesus turns around straight away, looks at the woman and says, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. So what did Matthew do once again? He improved the so-called word of God, the gospel of Matthew, by changing the image of Jesus. So if any Christian tries to explain away the text in Mark, they should first explain why Matthew was embarrassed by it and he changed it. So this is a problem when Christians think they can just quote from the New Testament to try to prove who Jesus is, when it's clear that the New Testament writers were willing to change the biography of Jesus in order to make it conform to their own beliefs. So rather than modify their beliefs to conform to Scripture, instead they will modify Scripture to conform to their beliefs. This is one of the main reasons Muslims will not accept the Gospels at face value, but instead we like to see what biblical scholarship has to say on the matter. So Richard will have to tell us whether he accepts what biblical scholars are saying, that there was an evolution and exaggeration of Jesus as time went on. If Richard denies this, then he should explain why Matthew kept changing Mark. If you thought the changes from Mark to Matthew seemed to improve the image of Jesus, then it would be interesting to see how the image of Jesus changes drastically when you go from Mark, Matthew, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, to the last gospel, which is John. In this gospel, far from being the humble prophet and messiah of the synoptic gospels, Jesus is instead almost exaggerated to the level of God, although even in John, Jesus still seems to fall short of being God. This explains why Christians seem to quote John a lot to prove that Jesus is God. I have a quote here from E.P. Standers in his book, The Historical Figure of Jesus, on page 70 to 71. It is impossible to think that Jesus spent his short ministry teaching in two such completely different ways from Mark and Matthew and Luke compared to John, conveying such different contents, and there were simply two traditions, each going back to Jesus, one transmitting 50% of what he said, and another one, the other 50%, with almost no overlaps, Consequently, for the last 150 or so years, scholars have had to choose. They have almost unanimously, and I think entirely correctly, concluded that the teaching of the historical Jesus is to be sought in the synoptic gospels and that John represents an advanced theological development in which meditations on the person and work of Christ are presented in the first person as if Jesus said them. So in other words, the anonymous author of John put his own interpretations of who Jesus is into the mouth of Jesus, hence why you get things like before Abraham was I am, etc. It's not that re Jesus really said it, it's actually John who made it up. I will now move on to my fourth point. Who did the people around Jesus believe he was in his historical lifetime? Well, Jesus asked his disciples this question in Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Who do the people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Then Jesus said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? To which Peter replied, you are the Messiah, full stop. Matthew adds the word son of God, but it's not there in Mark. And the, word, uh, the phrase son of God does not mean God or divine. Jews are called sons of God all over the Bible. And um, Israel is called the son of God in uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. So that doesn't prove anything. What about Jesus' family? Mary and the family, according to the New Testament, didn't seem to think he was God. For example, in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Mary and the family seemed to think Jesus was mad. Can you believe that Mary would believe Jesus is mad if she thought that he was a God? Doesn't sound like um, she believed he was God. What about John chapter 7, verse 40 to 41? People are arguing whether Jesus is the Messiah or the prophet like Moses. It seems strange that nobody's arguing that Jesus was God. What about John the Baptist? Christians believe that John the Baptist is the one foretold in Malachi who will prepare the way for Jesus. Now, did John the Baptist believe that Jesus was God when he baptized Jesus for the forgiveness of sins in Mark chapter 1? Another thing is, if John the Baptist knew that Jesus was God, then why didn't he follow him? 
Or why didn't John say to his followers, don't bother following me. As you see that man Jesus there, he's God in the flesh, go follow him. Why did the followers of John the Baptist stick with John whilst God was allegedly walking around Jerusalem locally? Moreover, why did John the Baptist, while he was in prison, send his followers to ask Jesus if he was the one, or should we wait for another? Does that mean that John the Baptist was waiting for another God-man to come? None of this makes any sense. I can go on with the list, but I think the point is made, so I will issue a little challenge to Richard. Please show me one person in his historical lifetime who believed he was God. I already know where you're going to try to point to, but I will deal with that if you bring it up. My final point is that there are certain texts that clearly refute that Jesus is God. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus denies that he and the Holy Ghost know the hour, as he says, only the Father knows. So since God the Son and the Holy Ghost are ignorant of the hour, they can't be God who's all-knowing. What about John chapter 17, verse number 3, where Jesus calls the Father the only true God? Also, John chapter 5, verse 44, where in context, Jesus refers to the Father as the one who alone is God. What about John chapter 10, when the Jews alleged that Jesus was claiming to be a God, does Jesus agree with them? No, instead he goes on to refute their charge, thus he explicitly denies claiming divinity when he quotes Psalm chapter 82 to them. What about John chapter 14 verse number 28, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. So that's my opening statement done. Um, in the remaining time, can I point out, uh, any, can I bring any responses or shall I leave that for the rebuttal? Yeah, rebuttal? Yes. Okay, so... Um, Thank you very much, and uh, I'll try to deal with as many points as I can in a rebuttal. Although a lot of the stuff that Richard raised is really due for tomorrow's debate, Islam or Christianity, which is the true faith. So I'm going to stick more on Jesus tonight. You can bring up Muhammad and any other point you want tomorrow. Thank you very much. I would now like to welcome Mr. Lucas to make a six-minute rebuttal at the lectern. Uh, thank you, Zakir. Kept me busy there, uh, making notes. Uh, let's start off by, um, uh, as I said, I expected Zakir's uh, main line of attack there was to, to undermine the credibility of the New Testament. I'm not sure we heard reasons uh, why we should believe that the Quran um, is a revelation from God, but we heard a lot about why we shouldn't uh, trust the, uh, the New Testament. Now, Zakir mentioned the infancy gospel, and he suggested that maybe it was an actual historical source about Jesus, about Jesus speaking in the cradle. But that was written in the 5th or 6th century. But even if it is, even if that Arabic infancy gospel does reflect some genuine report about Jesus speaking from the cradle, how do you account for the content of it being completely Islamized? I think there's just as much of a problem. If I was a Muslim, I would rather not believe that it was a, a report from them. Now, Zakir said about um, the Quran being in a different language. I obviously didn't use that, uh, that as an argument, the fact that the Quran is, in, a, is in, in Arabic. Now, Zakir made the point about prophecy, uh, suggesting that the, the Bible prophesies uh, Muhammad. Now, the reason Muslims believe that the Bible prophesies Muhammad is that the Quran says the Bible prophesies Muhammad. So if you're a Muslim, you have to find things in the Bible that prophesy Muhammad, otherwise the, the Quran is incorrect. So Muslims go to the Bible, I've been through it in a fine-tooth cone just to find any slither of a verse that could be taken to be prophesying Muhammad. I'm sure if any of you have ever read through Deuteronomy, you weren't struck by a verse that you thought that must be referring to Muhammad. The prophecy that Zakir spoke to was about um, a countryman. Now the word countryman clearly means in that context, uh, a fellow Israelite. In the book of Acts, Peter applies that very prophecy uh, to Jesus. The parallel stated with that prophecy is the one stated, someone who would speak God's words. Jesus did indeed speak God's words. At the time that prophecy was given, there weren't actually other prophets to refer to uh, apart from, uh, from Moses. Now again, Zacchaeus went on to, to suggest that some other um, statements about the Holy Spirit are actually about Muhammad as well. The heart of that is the word for uh, the Holy Spirit in Greece, helper, parakletos. Uh, some Muslims claim that that's a mistake. It should really say paraklutos, uh, which means honored or exalted one, which they take uh, could have meant Muhammad. 
Uh, there's not a shred of uh, documentary evidence that that was ever the word that was intended, but so a lot of Muslims suggest that that's what it must have, uh, have really meant. There are other verses as well that Muslims take uh, to suggest that Muhammad is prophesied uh, in the Bible. Um, now, Zacchaeus said that the, the church at various points has had arguments about the status of Jesus, was Jesus man or, or God or whatever. There were indeed controversies later on, but as I said, the New Testament documents are unanimous, and the early Christians were unanimous in their view on that. There have been dis debates and councils and arguments about Tawhid in Islam, the most fundamental doctrine of Islam, the oneness of God. There have been disputes about it within Islam. Now, Zakir quoted Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman's a very uh, famous scholar, very skeptical, um, attacks the Orthodox Christian faith, particularly in America. He was on the television a lot, writing books about it. And he said that Bart Ehrman claims that the church was divided between Gentiles and Jews uh, in its early days, and this dispute about the, the, state of Je of, um, the status of Jesus. That's just absolutely untrue. There were, there were controversies in the early church, and we've got records of them. You can read about some of them in the New Testament. You can read some in uh, Galatians chapter 2. You can read some in Acts chapter 15. But it tells you what these disputes were about. They were about circumcision, the place of the Jewish law for Gentile converts, uh, the role of women in the church. To suggest that those disputes were about the, the divinity of Jesus, there's, there's, there's no evidence at all that that was a contentious issue uh, in the very earliest church. Now, Zacchaeus accused, accused the New Testament of exaggeration. He started off by saying the Gospel of Mark was written first. That uh, may well have been. I don't think there's conclusive evidence of that. Some of the very earliest Christians um, said that they thought Matthew was written first, but Mark may well have, have been written first. Zacchaeus then said Matthew and Luke copied Mark. I don't think there's evidence to suggest that is what happened. If these stories were circulating in oral form, they would circulate in slightly different versions. So one writer might take one version that, that he'd heard and record that one. Another writer could take uh, another version. But in, in Mark and Matthew and Luke, sometimes the same story is recounted with quite different wording, which rather undermines the copying uh, hypothesis. Okay. Um. Okay, moving to Zacchaeus, attacks on... Uh, things to do with the New Testament, about things that have changed. How significant did you think those changes were? Jesus could not perform more miracles. Jesus did not. Call me good. Ask me about what is good. Who touched me? The other reports didn't say Jesus didn't say he touched me. Uh, who touched me? It just doesn't record it. Maybe that report just didn't include that. It included other things instead. But there is an example of a case where the report in Mark is more impressive and sounds more miraculous than it does in, for example, Matthew or Luke. Uh, when Jesus heals a boy with an evil spirit, in Mark it says people were saying he's dead, and he takes him by the hand and he rises up. In Matthew and Luke, it doesn't sound that impressive. It, it just says he was, he was ill, convulsing, whatever, and he was, he was cured, so much less dramatic. So it's not the case that things get more and more uh, impressive. Now, you notice Zacchaeus was saying, oh, it's in John's Gospel that you have all this about uh, Jesus being God. You'll notice I didn't use John's Gospel. I used Mark's Gospel deliberately because I, I expected Zacchaeus to be claiming that that was the original one and the other one's exaggerated and exaggerated. That's why I stuck to, um, to Mark's Gospel. Okay, right, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Hussein, to reply. Hello once again. So, I don't feel Richard touched on most of my points. Like, most of his opening statements were red herrings. Like, sources for the Quran and historical stuff, that stuff is for tomorrow, it's not for today. It's not possible for me to um, respond to so many different points in six minutes. But I want to talk about some of the things that he brought up in his opening statement. Like, for example, he says, oh, um, Jesus forgave sins. Is that supposed to prove he's God because um, the Pharisees got angry? But what about Matthew chapter 9, where it quotes the people who said, um, how, um, how glorious is God that he gave man such authority? 
As James Don points out in his book, Parting of the Ways, the reason the Pharisees were angry is they were thinking, on oh, what authority is he telling him that his sins are forgiven? He's not part of the temple cult. So it wasn't that he was claiming to be God. So if Jesus telling somebody that his sins are forgiven makes him God, then I'd like Richard to tell us if the disciples are God. Because in John chapter 20, the disciples can also forgive sins. He also said that um, the high priest yelled blasphemy because Jesus said that uh, I am and a, a, um, Daniel's clouds under heaven. But the point is, if you go to Luke's gospel and you go to other manuscripts of Mark, what Jesus actually said is, you say that I am. And when he quoted Daniel's prophecy, that doesn't mean that um, the person in Daniel is God because it says that person was given dominion. God cannot be forgiven, um, given dominion. And even Jews who interpreted Daniel's prophecy never understood it as being somebody who's actually God. The word worship for the person is son of man is also used for David's wife um, who worshipped, in inverted commas, David. And David Klinghoffer in his book, Why the Jews Reject Jesus, also mentioned that the word for worship there can also be used to pay homage to another man. And Dr. Michael L. Brown in his book, Answering Jewish um, Objections to Jesus, he's a Christian scholar, admits that that's the case. So Daniel chapter 7 doesn't prove that Jesus is God. And moreover, you quoting that text actually refutes that Jesus is God because that text is a false prophecy. Jesus said to the high priest, you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. But that high priest died 2,000 years ago and Jesus never came in the clouds of heaven. So can you explain that false prophecy, please, Richard? Then he said, oh, there's something special about Jesus. He calls God Father. But all Jews called God Father. Malachi called God Father. Isaiah called God Father. Deuteronomy calls God Father. So that don't make Jesus special. Um, he also said that he first claimed that the, uh, Jesus' followers wrote the New Testament. But then I've showed biblical scholars who confirmed that Matthew and Luke copied from Mark. They actually chained the image of Jesus. Did eyewitnesses need to go to Mark, who's not an eyewitness, and copy from him? No. So you haven't proven that term, the New Testament's from eyewitnesses. Paul was an eyewitness. So you're just saying things about Jesus, what other people said, but I quoted you, Jesus. Then he said there were no controversy with the church fathers. Yeah, there were disputes between Muslims regarding Tawheed, but nowhere on the level of who Jesus was. Some church fathers believed Jesus had a beginning. Some of them believed that the um, origin, for example, one of the greatest church fathers, believed Jesus was subordinate to the Father. So it took four centuries for the Nicene Creed to become official. He also said that... Um, there's no evidence that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba. I can quote the Talmud and a lot of um, non-Islamic sources to show that, but I will issue a challenge to you. Can you give me a non-biblical uh, source that shows that dead people rose up in Jerusalem and started walking around like Matthew claims? Can you show me one source, please? Give me one historian, Josephus, or anyone from the first century who heard anybody say that dead people rose up when Jesus allegedly got crucified and walked into Jerusalem. If you can't um, show me a source, you've refuted your own argument, and that's inconsistency. He says the Quran got mixed up regarding the sister of Aaron, but in the Quranic language, when somebody's from the, the tribe of someone, they can be called the brother or sister of that person. So we believe that uh, Mary was from the tribe of Levi, which second century Christian sources confirm. So the earliest biographies we got of Mary claim she was from Levi, not from Judah. So we believe that she was called sister of Aaron in the sense of being from the tribe of Aaron. But if that's an error for the Quran, what are you going to do about, I, I believe it's Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus claimed the Jews killed Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, between the altar. But if you go to the Old Testament, it wasn't Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who died near the altar. It was Zechariah, the son of Jehodiah. So Jesus mixed up the two Zechariahs. I'd like you to respond to that, please. He says... Um, Deuteronomy can't refer to Muhammad because the word countryman means fellow Israelite. Actually, Genesis chapter 16 explicitly calls Ishmael the brethren of his brothers, which is Isaac and the other sons of Ishmael, um, of um, Abraham. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 2, the Edomites, who are Arabs, are called the brethren of the Israelites. So you have a contradiction there then. If you claim Deuteronomy 18 is talking about a fellow Israelite, then Deuteronomy chapter 34 denies that a prophet in Israel can be like Moses. This is why the Jewish study Bible claims there's a contradiction in this text. The only explanation is brethren refers to an Arab, not to a fellow Israelite. He says that our Muslims have been combing the Old Testament for prophecies of Muhammad. Um, who said that um, we need to go to the Greek of John? to find Muhammad's name. The Syriac, which uh, many of the Greek author, um, many of the Eastern Christians from the 
um, 4th, 5th, and 6th century, they read their New Testament in Syriac, and the word Munahma is the Syriac form of the Arabic Ahmad, which is a superlative form of Muhammad, so we can find him by name. But now I've got a challenge for you. Matthew chapter 2, verse 23 claims that the Old Testament has a prophecy that he will be called a Nazarene. I'd like you to show me where this sentence is in the Old Testament, that he will be called a Nazarene. So we'll see how you comb through the Old Testament. Regarding... Um, Six minutes done. All right, thanks a lot. Would you like a minute? Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Mr. Lucas to continue. Well, thank you. I'd like to start just by uh, pointing out again that Zakir isn't giving us reasons why we should accept the Quran's account uh, as reliable, but he's continuing to attack the reliability of the New Testament. Uh, as I said, I think the big picture in this debate is that Zakir, Zakir believes what he believes because the Quran says it, but he isn't defending it on the basis of uh, convincing us that the Quran is reliable. Instead, he's undermining the New Testament uh, in various ways. Now, Zakir said it wasn't relevant, the fact that I was showing that the Quran has incorporated accounts which we've every reason to think are fictional uh, legends, folklore, uh, that were written centuries after Jesus. If that isn't significant to tonight's debate in terms of the reliability of the Quran as a source of information about Jesus, right, I really don't know what is. That seems highly relevant uh, to me. Uh, Zakir said, no, maybe it wasn't just God who would, could forgive sins. But look at the response of the priest. That's the way they obviously understood that um, at the time. Uh, with the Son of Man, Zakia tried to equivocate about the term worship that was used. That was part of my argument. But the phrases that were applied to the Son of Man and other parts of Daniel's prophecy are phrases that are applied to God. Um, Zakia said, well, Jesus said, you will see me coming in the clouds. And the, uh, the, the high priest didn't see Jesus coming in the clouds. That's Jesus quoting uh, from the passage about the Son of Man to illustrate, to tie it in, to make it clear that he's referring to the Son of Man as spoken about in the prophecy uh, of Daniel. Uh, there are other instances of, of people in the Bible in the Old Testament referring to God uh, as Father, but I said the intimate Abba uh, word was uh, unique to Jesus. Now, as the quoted Bart Ehrman, I said a very skeptical scholar uh, in this area, but I'd like to read something that Bart Ehrman uh, wrote quite recently. He said, until a year ago, I would have said, and frequently did say, in the classroom, in public lectures, and in my writings, that Jesus is portrayed as God in the Gospel of John, but not, definitely not, in the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I finally yielded. These Gospels do indeed think of Jesus as divine being made the very son of God who can heal, cast out demons, raise the dead, pronounce divine forgiveness, receive worship, together suggest that even for these gospels, Jesus was a divine being, not a human. So yes, now I agree that Jesus is portrayed as a divine being, a God-man in all of the gospels. If you look at the statistics through the gospels and the number of times Jesus is called the son of man, uh, the, the son of God, but it's, it's multiple occasions in all of the Gospels. I think the thesis that this develops slowly, it's only really there in John, it's not really there in Mark, just doesn't hold water uh, at all. Now, I was fascinated, I, I think I heard this right, I think Zacchaeus said that I'm quoting second-hand reports about Jesus, and I think Zacchaeus said that he was quoting from Jesus directly. I'd be fascinated to hear Zacchaeus expanding on that, as to where his more direct sources than Jesus' friends and followers writing their eyewitnesses' accounts are. Um, now, Zacchaeus said that the sources about Abraham and Ishmael uh, building the Kaaba, um, etc. The fact that, that that's what I'm saying about sources. Lots of stories were made up in the intervening years between the New Testament or between the Old Testament. And, and the Quran, a lot of them are incorporated in the Quran. It's not that there's not sources, it's that there's not reliable sources, sources with any sort of historical uh, credibility. Now, Zakir uh, explained about Mary being the, the sister of Aaron. All I can say to you is to me that that sounded quite contrived, the way he was trying to, um, uh, to avoid the conclusion there. I mean, why would Allah reveal it saying, um, 
Ma Mary, sister of Aaron. If it was Muslims for centuries from then on, we're going to have this difficult job explaining exactly uh, what that meant. Right. Thank you. Hello once again. I think, Richard, you misunderstood me. When I said I'm speaking the words of Jesus directly, what I meant is you're quoting Paul. Paul says this about Jesus. But I'm quoting the parts of the New Testament where Jesus is supposed to be talking himself. So Jesus' words are higher authority than Paul. That's what I tried to say. He says, I haven't given you a reason that the Quran is the, um, it should be trusted, but I told you that the book of Deuteronomy uh, prophesizes a person who will be from the brethren of the Israelites. Since Deuteronomy 34 denies a fellow Israelite can be that prophet, it can only be from the Arabs. You haven't refuted that yet. He says fictional legends... Uh, but you still never responded to Matthew when all the dead people raised up and walked into Jerusalem. You never gave me one source outside the book of Matthew, so your own argument has been refuted. Regarding what Jesus said to the high priest, Jesus said to him, you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. That never happened. It's a false prophecy, Richard. He told the high priest, you shall see. That never happened. So the very text you quoted, if, if I wasn't a Muslim, I would, I would believe Jesus is a false prophet because of that text. So um, I'm happy to stick with the Quran. He says Bart Ehrman's latest book, basically Bart Ehrman says that Mark teaches that Jesus is divine. But what you're misunderstanding, um, Richard, is Bart Ehrman doesn't believe that Jesus' actual historical disciples believe Jesus was God. All he's saying is the anonymous writer who wrote Mark believed Jesus was divine. And even then, um, Ehrman meant it in the sense that the way Jews see Moses as divine, the way some of them from the Dead Sea Scrolls see Enoch as divine in that sense, Ehrman doesn't believe that Mark teaches that Jesus is divine in the same sense that John teaches that Jesus is allegedly divine. So you're you kind of like misrepresenting Ehrman there. Regarding Jesus being called the Son of God, that's a Jewish idiom. Um, God's got sons by the tongues in the Old Testament. Jesus being called the Son of God doesn't mean anything special. It doesn't mean he's God. It doesn't mean he's divine. Regarding the sister of Evan, no, it's not contrived. In um, Surah, um, Surah 5, I think, Ayah 45, um, it says that, uh, Surah 3, Ayah 45, it says that um, Hud is from the brethren of Ad. So a person is called the brother of his tribe. It's just a Semitic figure of speech. So when Mary came with that baby and these people were shocked that this woman's not married, she's got a baby. They said to her, oh, sister of Aaron, in other words, you're from the high priestly family of Aaron. How could you be coming without being married with a baby? That's all that was being pointed out. And I've also pointed out that Jesus made a mix-up in the New Testament to which you never even bothered responding. Was it Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who Jesus claimed? Or was it the Old Testament, Zechariah, son of Jehodiah? So your old argument goes against you. He says that the Quran quotes from sources that are fictional and made up, etc. But what about the fact that your own biblical scholars are telling you that John made up things about Jesus like before Abraham was, I am, etc. The Quran claims to confirm and correct the teachings found in the previous scriptures. If you have a problem with the Quran quoting from a second century gospel, why don't you have a problem with the book of Jude quoting from a book of Enoch when Enoch, according to your Bible, lived at the time of Adam, that's thousands of years ago, whereas the book that he quoted from, the book of Enoch, was written 100 years before Jesus. So why don't you condemn the New Testament for, for quoting from apocryphal fictional books? So there's two standards being um, used here. So I don't think he's brought up anything. He hasn't responded to why Jesus didn't know the hour and denied why the Holy Spirit knew the hour, why Matthew kept changing uh, Mark, like, is there, is there not a fundamental difference when Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And Matthew changed it to, why do you ask me about what is good? If there's not a big difference there, what was the reason Matthew had to do it? Change it. And it wasn't all just oral. Biblical scholarship now believe, and if you think Bart Ehrman's too skeptical, what about Daniel Wallace, who is a good friend of Dr. James White and is conservative, who admits that when Matthew and Luke wrote their Gospels, they had a copy of Mark in front of them, and they edited things as they went along. So, is Daniel Wallace skeptical? Over. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. It's now time to welcome you from the floor. Uh, before we get going with this, a few ground rules. 
Uh, we're certainly going to practice equality of opportunity here, so each speaker is going to get the chance to respond to each question regardless of who the question has been asked to. So if I'd like to welcome people to come down for Mr. Lucas and for Mr. Hussain. Okay, so this is um, my question to uh, Mr. Hussain. Yeah, um, the thing that I uh, want to ask you is, my understanding as a, as a Christian is that Jesus communicated that God was not just transcendent, that he was knowable, and that he said, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, which uh, for Christians gives tremendous hope that God can be known and that it's possible to have a relationship with him through Jesus. So I would ask Mr. Hussein what he considers about that part of Jesus' claim that God is knowable uh, through, his, his, uh, through his work, which he claimed was that he came to seek and to save the lost and to die on a cross for that, their salvation. Thank you. Do I stand up? No, no, yeah. from the table. Uh, first, I'd just like to make a correction. I said Surah 345. Uh, it was actually Surah 11, Ayah 50, if you want to check the reference. Regarding um, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, a Muslim has no problem with that statement because every prophet was the way, the truth, and the life for their respective followers. When Moses was alive, he was the way, the truth, and the life. To get to God, you had to go through him. And same for John the Baptist, same for Solomon, everyone. What you got to understand is when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one gets to God but through me, that actually shows that Jesus is not God. Because notice he's saying, I'm the way. I'm the motorway. I'm not the destination. So just like the M M6 is the, um, the route to London, for example, the M6 is not London itself. The same way Jesus is the way to God, but he's not God himself. So that's not a claim to divinity, in my opinion. Yeah, I think um, this is a really key difference between Christianity and Islam, the idea of, of, sort of relating to God, uh, knowing to God. Um, I think in Christianity, God reveals himself to us. God welcomes us into a relationship with him uh, in this life, but then carries on uh, into eternity. I think the picture, the picture in Islam, as far as I can see with most Muslims, is in this life, life God doesn't reveal really himself. God reveals his will. And if you follow God's will then you can go and experience God more closely uh, in the afterlife. And I think that's a huge difference in terms of the experience of, of being a Christian compared to being a Muslim. Yeah, I mean, the part of that statement is that Jesus says, uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So he's implying a relational, uh, that, God, that, that God is great, but he's also personal and can be related to. So that, I understand as a Muslim, uh, that Muslims believe that God is completely transcendent and cannot be known. And so, in my mind, the greatest thing about uh, Christianity is the idea that God can be known, and there is hope that God has made an incredibly great plan that sinful men can, can know him. That's an amazing thought. Can I respond to that? Uh, yes, you will. Yeah. I'd just like to point out regarding that, that Muslims and also Jews do know God. For example, Jesus in John chapter 4 says to the Samaritan woman, we, meaning the Jews, know who we worship. So the Jews who didn't believe in Jesus, who didn't um, uh, believe in the New Testament, knew God. Same way us Muslims know God through our revelation, through the Quran. God has revealed who he is to us through the Quran. So we don't feel like we're, we're behind with, uh, when it comes to our relationship with God as compared to Christians. But I understand your point, um, but I don't agree with it. Mr. Lucas? Yeah, I think that's, that's a big contrast. If you think about that uh, just in human terms, the difference between someone being revealed to you through a book and being revealed uh, through a person and through personal relationship is, is, a, is a huge contrast. There's a large amount of historical evidence outside the Bible that uh, Jesus was crucified on a cross. And this is a pretty central understanding of Christianity, that Christ died for our sins on a cross. Uh, why is the Quran wrong um, in, in saying that Jesus did not die on a cross? 
Or how can you believe the Quran when so much historical evidence points to his crucifixion? Thank you. Number one, the Quran doesn't deny history because Surah 4, Ayah 157 says it was made to appear so. So the Quran doesn't deny the historical event of the crucifixion. But what the Quran and the Old Testament together confirm is that the Messiah was not going to die. He was going to be saved by God. For example, the book of Psalms chapter 20 explicitly says that God will save his Messiah, that he will hear the prayer of his Messiah from heaven and shall rescue him. This is Psalms chapter 20. So we get in Matthew chapter 26 that Jesus prayed to be saved from the cross. So the Muslims believe that God accepted his uh, request. And moreover, the Old Testament itself, Psalm 91, another messianic text says that the Messiah will be saved. To believe Jesus died on the cross at Calvary would actually prove that he's a false Messiah and a false prophet. Because in Luke chapter 13, verse number 3, Jesus says, For it is impossible for a prophet to perish outside Jerusalem. He was talking about himself. Yet Calvary, the cross, was outside Jerusalem. So if Christians do insist that he died on the cross there, they would insist that, that he gave a false prophecy in Luke chapter 13, verse 33. So I'd rather believe the Quran, which says that he was saved, which agrees with the Old Testament, than believe the New Testament um, and believe Jesus was a false Messiah who died outside Jerusalem. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. I think there's a major, major problem for the Muslim position here. If Allah made it appear so, so Allah made it appear that Jesus died on the cross, and then he raised him into heaven, uh, uh, in, secretly, I assume. So um, Allah has therefore done uh, what led people to the conclusion that Jesus um, had risen from the dead. Okay. Um, but then it says it's a terrible sin to actually believe it. So Allah made it look like Jesus was crucified and killed, but then he wasn't actually, and it took him up to heaven. But if you actually believe that, that what Allah tried to make it look like happened, that's a terrible, terrible sin. And that's a major uh, problem there. The idea that prophets can't be killed, messiahs can't be killed. If you, look at Je if you understand Jesus' mission, to offer his life um, as an atoning sacrifice, which is the clear teaching throughout the New Testament, it's entirely consistent. And to challenge that on some sort of misinterpreted technicalities of bits of verses here and there is to miss the main thrust of the central theme of the New Testament and to challenge it on, say, dubious interpretations of uh, peripheral verses. Well, my response to that is, number one, there's no proof that the disciples believe that Jesus died. Even if they had for the moment believed that he died, God could grant them a vision, for example, to show that Jesus did survive. And that is actually in Muslim beliefs that um, the disciples weren't uh, told that Jesus survived the cross. But back to my point regarding Jesus being a false messiah if he died, Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 33, and I hope you write that in the text, that it is impossible for a prophet to perish outside Jerusalem. He was talking about himself. Yet, according to the New Testament, Jesus perished outside Jerusalem, which would make him a false prophet, because he made a statement that it's um, impossible for me to perish outside Jerusalem, and that's exactly what happened. So that makes um, a major hole in the belief that Jesus is the Messiah. So once again, I'd rather stick to the Quran, which agrees with the Old Testament that the Messiah will be saved, Psalms 20, than the New Testament, which makes Jesus a false Messiah. Thank you. We'll have one more comment on this before the next question. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, sorry, we'll have one more comment. Uh, can I just come out? Uh, so Kier asked, what proof do we have that the disciples believed uh, that Jesus was dead? Uh, I don't want to sound flippant, uh, but they buried him. Okay, thank you. Uh, you were saying that it's a big, it was a big uh, question for Christians to decide whether Jesus was, was God or not. Um, and how would you explain that uh, Jesus in the Bible was called uh, the Lord? which in the Old Testament was always used for Yahweh, which was also used for as a, as a God of the Old Testament. And even the, the disciples called Jesus Lord. Uh, in Greek, it's uh, kurios, which is the same as in the Old Testament for Yahweh. For example, um, uh, Thomas, when he saw Jesus, um, when he rose from the dead, he called him my, lo my Lord and my God. And Jesus never rebuked him. Uh, he commanded him, saying that uh, you, you believe because you saw me. Um, blessed are those who didn't see me but but believed. One question at a time, please. I'll, I'll, I'll forget what you said then. Okay, so basically, 
um, your first point was that Jesus was called Lord and only God is called Lord. And also Thomas called him my Lord and my God. Right. The first point is um, not only God alone was called Lord in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. For example, in the book of um, Second Peter, it mentions that Sarah called Abraham Lord. It's the same word, curious. If you go to the book of Genesis, um, Jacob calls Esau his Lord. So there were many other people called Lords in the Bible. So, you know, it's, it's just like in England, you've got the House of Lords. So when it's applied to Jesus, it doesn't mean he's God. And um, what was your other point again? Uh, Thomas, yeah. The, the Thomas incident, see, this is another proof of what my, uh, the scholars I quoted are saying, that there was a development in the Gospels. If you believe that the Gospel of Luke is reliable, then it is impossible for the Gospel of John to be correct regarding the Thomas incident. Because in Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to all of the 11 remaining disciples in the upper room. They all see him at the same time, and then Jesus on the same day ascends to heaven. Whereas according to John, Jesus appeared to the other disciples first, and then after a while, he see, um, after a few days, was it? He sees Thomas, and Thomas calls him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, oh, you have believed. But if Luke is correct that Jesus, uh, the 11 disciples seen Jesus in the upper room at the same time, then that means Thomas had already seen Jesus along with the other disciples. And Jesus ascended on Easter Sunday, which means John's story of um, Thomas um, seeing him and saying, my Lord and my God is impossible. Because according to Luke, he had already ascended. So that's a fabricated story, which is another reason the Gospel of John is not reliable. Thank you. Mr. Lee. I come back to the first one about um, using the word, uh, the word Lord. And it was used in other contexts as well. But the point is, in the New Testament, is that it's used um, with Old Testament verses, and Lord is substituted for Yahweh. So verses that were about Yahweh, about God, the same verse is taken, but instead of Yahweh, it would say Lord. Okay, so Jesus Christ has been put in the place of God in those. Now, I, think, I think no matter what evidence, I put, no matter what mountain of evidence is presented, Zacchaeus is going to try and chip away at some point and find another detail here, there, and everywhere uh, to challenge. But the, it's, it's a mountain, and it's as though it's just ch chipping away at little bits here and there, but the mountain of evidence um, still remains. Skier was just talking about the accounts conflicting with each other. Um, the New Testament accounts are different. Um, a good book, Easter Enigma, is a, a book worth a read on this. It's quite a complex issue to take all the different reports and to try and see if they can fit together uh, into a credible, coherent uh, account. Sometimes it takes a bit of juggling, but it can be done. You'd think that, yes, maybe that happened, then that happened. Maybe he meant this by this. And they can all be fit together. But let's say even if they can't, even if the accounts are contradictory. If you're assessing historical sources and they've got the main pictures the same, you know, Jesus ascended, Jesus was crucified, uh, appeared to lots of people, uh, tomb was empty, etc., but different in details. If you're looking as a historian at that, you look at the central points that are attested time and time again by an independent sources and you would be convinced of their veracity. You wouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater because secondary details don't agree. Ask any lawyer working in a court of law about that. That's the way you'd, you'd proceed. So can you respond? Yes, sir. So rather than recommending the book, Richard's job tonight is to answer my point. If Luke is correct that Jesus appeared to all his disciples, the 11 remaining disciples, which included Thomas, in the upper room, and then he ascended that same day, how is it possible that John is correct that Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared, and then after a few days, Jesus ascended then. If Luke is correct, then John's story about Jesus appearing to Thomas afterward is impossible. So rather than recommending the book, please deal with that point. Okay, I'll, uh, that the thing is, what Muslims can do is to take the entire Bible and look through the, any New Testament scholarship and just pick out little bits here and there, a little challenge about this bit and this bit and this bit. Now that particular point, I don't know for that one. I've never heard that particular point. I've heard lots and lots of others. But I do know that these points in general have been addressed and the accounts are, there is a way of harmonizing the accounts into a coherent whole. On that particular issue, I don't know about that exact one, but I know the big picture is they can be. But what about my second point? Even if they can't, that doesn't undermine their reliability about the central themes where they all agree. Thank you. Um, just to, so we would very much like some questions to be directed to Mr. Lucas as well, but I believe we have a new question. 
basically uh, Jesus warned us uh, that there will be many false prophets that will come after him. Uh, in Matthew 24, 11, he said that many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And then in verse, uh, again, um, chapter 24, the same chapter, verse 24 says, For, uh, false Christ and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders, uh, as to lead uh, people astray, even if, po if possible, even at the, the elect. So basically, uh, Jesus warned us that there will be false prophets coming after him. Uh, and how uh, can we believe that Muhammad is the, the, the true prophet, even though Jesus warned us, and there, will be, there were many other people who had revelations from angels, uh, like Prophet Muhammad, we had uh, Joseph Smith, uh, we had Mr. Russell, um, and, and a number of other prophets who, called, uh, who say that they have had the revelation from an angel, uh, which is contrary to the New Testament. And okay, Apostle, thank you. I think we've got the question now. Which was and Apostle Paul said also that if the angel comes to you and appears to you and he uh, the, uh, says something different uh, than is, is in the gospel, uh, then basically the person would be accursed. So how would you reply that we should believe Muhammad even though we were warned by Apostle Paul and Jesus himself? Uh, my response to that is, number one, Muhammad is a true prophet because, like I said, Deuteronomy 4 tells him that hasn't been refuted yet. Regarding Jesus speaking about false prophets to come after him who will deceive people, it's actually interesting that that passage applies to Paul more than anybody else. Number one, Paul openly admitted to deceiving people. He said in his letters, to a Jew, I'm a Jew. To one under the law, I'm a law. To one who's not under the law, I'm not under the law. In other words, he'll act like anything to gain converts. Now, that's a deceiver. Moreover, the book of Deuteronomy tells us how to test a false prophet if they give false prophecies. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 claimed that Jesus would return within his lifetime and, the, uh, and his followers. Did that happen? No, it's been 2,000 years and it's a false prophecy. So that Matthew chapter 24 quote about false prophets applies to Paul, not Muhammad. And also it applies to Joseph Smith as well. Well, coming back to that, the idea of finding Muhammad prophesied in the Bible, I'd just like to re-emphasize the Quran says that Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. Therefore, before Muslims even open the Bible, they already believe that in there somewhere, Muhammad's prophesied. So it's just a matter of find it, finding it. And they, they clutch at straws with them. Now, as far as I'm aware, the only reason Zakir has given tonight why we should accept Muhammad's prophethood and the Quran as a revelation from God is this passage from Deuteronomy 18, which doesn't mention Muhammad, doesn't mention the Quran, is, is entirely vague and there's, there's no reason at all to think it applies directly uh, to Muhammad. Now, I think we had a really interesting insight in the last bit into Zakia's thinking on this. Zakia took Paul's phrase uh, where he said, to Jews I become Jews, to be Greeks I become Greeks, etc. What Paul's obviously meaning is that he tries to enter into their culture, he tries to speak their language, he tries to relate with ideas um, that they will understand, <laughs> tries to get alongside them. That's the obvious way to interpret that, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I can understand that quite clearly, but Zakir looks at that and he says Paul's obviously a liar. Now, I think that's an interesting insight into how Zakir interprets the Bible. So I'd say tonight, if there's some parts of what Zakir says that you think, I'm not quite sure that's been answered. I said earlier on, Zakir raised a point. I, I didn't really know the answer to that one. But I think that gives us an insight into the way Zakir interprets the Bible. All right, my response to that is... Um Point number one, regarding what I said about Paul, it's not my interpretation. See, this is one of the things. When I call arguments against Christianity, I don't just pull them out of thin air. I read biblical scholarship. I never brought all my collection. I got three books on me. One of the proofs that Paul's quote, to a Jew, I'm a Jew, to one under the law, I, um, I act under the law, is a proof that he was a deceiver with all due respect, is that Acts chapter 21, verse 21, James and the disciples of Jesus heard that Paul was preaching against the law of Moses, so they confronted him on it, that if you, if you didn't preach against the law of Moses, in front of everyone now, do the Nazareth vow and purify yourself. And Paul, in front of everybody, did that. So to their face, he denied that he preached against the law of Moses. But when you go to his own letters, he did preach against the law of Moses. This is why the interpreter's Bible commentary on Acts chapter 21 says that if Paul did this, then he was a hypocrite. So it's not my interpretation. Moreover, 
You haven't responded to Paul's false prophecy. First Thessalonians chapter 4, when he says, We who are still alive will be scooped up by Christ. Did that happen? No. So Matthew chapter 24 refers to Paul and Joseph Smith, but not to Muhammad. And regarding prophecies and clutching at straws, yes, the Quran claims that Muhammad's in the Bible, so we look for prophecies. Same way, Luke chapter 24 claims Jesus is in the Old Testament, and you look for prophecies. But unlike Christians, we don't go to made-up prophecies. So you can show everybody tonight my challenge where in the Old Testament is the prophecy that Matthew claimed that he will be called a Nazarene? I want to see that sentence tonight. You think you will have one more comment than the next question? Yeah. Come on, this idea of Paul preaching against the law, I think that's, that's a really wooden interpretation. It's, it's willing, it's, it's trying to find evidence that Paul's lying. Did Paul preach against the law? That's a complicated question. My answer to that would be quite nuanced. There'd be some ways in which you set aside parts of the law, um, reinterpreted, so it's played a different role and um, had a different place in the life of the Gentile converts, etc., etc. That's quite a subtle question, but it's not a subtle question for Zacchaeus. It's Paul's a liar, black and white. And it's rigid, over rigid interpretation to find contradictions because that's what he wants to find. Can I respond to that? Uh, no, I think we'll move Just to the next one session. sentence. Thanks. Maybe incorporate it into your closing right. speech. Thank you. Next question, please. Oh, um, okay. I've got a question for Mr. Lucas. Um, it's just about the weak contention earlier on about Daniel 7 and how, whether that proves that the Son of Man um, is, you know, is, is, a refer, uh, is a proof that um, Jesus is God when he's referred to as Son of Man. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us a more in-depth um, illustration of um, explanation of, yeah, but regarding that. Uh, the Son of Man, right. Um, to summarize what I was saying, in, in Daniel's prophecy there, there's the description of the, the figure, a mysterious figure, uh, the Son of Man, who is brought into God's presence and is given authority and discre- um, statements that are applied to God in other parts of the same prophecy are applied to the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is worshipped. Now, in that context, worship is only to God. I mean, if Jews are clear about anything at that time, that's one thing they were very clear on. Worship is for God alone. So this figure has statements about God's power and authority, universal power and authority applied to him, and is worshipped, and yet is distinct from the Ancient of Days. So we've got two figures, one like a son of man, seemed to be a more human form, and then we've also got the, uh, the more Uh, maybe sort of traditional idea, the ancient of days of God on his throne, but they're both described in terms that could only apply to God. Now, in Daniel's prophecy, that was a very mysterious thing, but I think it was given an insight into what it meant for Jesus to be be God incarnate. And I think when Jesus used that term, that's what he was intending to allude to. Now, the term son of man was not used in a similar way before Jesus at all. There's no record of people calling themselves that, but Jesus did, then it also wasn't used in the early church. When we you know, sing hymns today, we don't tend to mention the Son of Man. So it doesn't seem to be something that the, the early Christians like saying, so they sort of wrote it back and said, oh, we think Jesus is saying it. There weren't people before then using that language, so it was distinctly from Jesus with a very definite purpose to associate himself with the figure in Daniel's prophecy. I'm sorry, but I'll have to reject most of what Richard said on the basis that the Son of Man is given dominion. Now, even the child knows that God is not given dominion. So before he was given it, what, did Jesus have the dominion? No. So it, um, that Son of Man is not God. Moreover, Richard's statement regarding the Son of Man not being applied to anyone before Jesus is incorrect. The Dead Sea Scrolls confirms that the same term was applied to Enoch. Regarding the Son of Man being worshipped, I already responded to that. The same word is used for David's wife worshipping David. And David Klinghoffer and Michael L. Brown um, both confirmed that. The other thing is, where Jesus allegedly claimed to be the Son of Man is a false prophecy. When Jesus said to the high priest, you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, did that happen? The answer is no. So why do you go to a text to try to prove Jesus is God when that text itself is a false prophecy? So um, I feel sorry for people who believe in the New Testament. I swear to God, if I wasn't a Muslim and I didn't believe in the Quran and I read the New Testament, I would have to side with the Jews. That's being honest. So that's one of the reasons why, thank God, God sent down the Quran so I can believe in Jesus as the Messiah and not believe he failed the test of Deuteronomy by giving false prophecies. Um, do, do, don't the prophecies from the Old Testament 
depicting the Messiah and the means of his life and death and birth and resurrection. Um, do, have you not, have you, can you not see in those prophecies evidence that Jesus is in fact who he claimed to be? And okay, thank I, you. I wonder what Richard would like to say about that. Uh, Mr. Wickstein. Uh, I think a lot of prophecies in the, in the Old Testament are obviously fulfilled in, in Jesus. You mentioned Isaiah. I think the most significant one for tonight's debate is uh, unto you a son will be born, he will be called, and it says mighty God. So it's saying a Messiah. Messiah just means yeah, a sort of anointed one uh, or, or whatever. So there, there are lots of people who could be described as a Messiah, but it's saying one will be coming who will be called uh, mighty God, which I think is, is quite a remarkable statement that we do see fitting in with, uh, with what I believe uh, about Jesus. See, this is uh, one of the problems with um, the way Christians look at prophecies. Basically, the thing that uh, Richard was accusing me and the Muslims of is actually what the Christians do. Like he quoted Isaiah chapter 9 now, that cannot be talking about Jesus because even if it, this person is called mighty God, that doesn't mean that Jesus is mighty God because Hebrew names always represent um, the, the God that they represent. Hezekiah's got God's name in it. Um, Gabriel, the angel, means mighty God. Whereas this person is also called the everlasting father. Now, if you want to apply that to Jesus, that would make Jesus the father, which is a heresy according to the Trinity. Moreover, Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 said, call no man on earth the father, for you have one father who is in heaven. So Jesus was on earth at this time, so Isaiah 9, 6 cannot apply to him. Moreover, the term mighty God, Martin Luther himself admitted that the same term can mean divine hero or mighty hero. So that doesn't prove Jesus is God. Whereas Isaiah 53, the person in Isaiah 53 can't be Jesus because it also says this person will see his seed, but Jesus didn't have seed. He didn't have no children. So these are so-called prophecies that Christians claim are about Jesus when in fact they're not when read in context. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, my question is for both uh, Mr. Hussain and Mr. Uh, Lucas. So Mr. Hussain, first, thank you very much for coming over from Birmingham and express a very uh, opposing view that's central to Christian faith. Uh, you multiple times quoted this reference uh, that's been talked about in, from Daniel in the conversation between the high priest and Jesus Christ. And you said that Jesus wasn't claiming to be divine men because he said that you say that I'm the son of man. If you follow that line of logic, afterwards the high priest said that you are being blasphemous. Why didn't Jesus say, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm not being blasphemous. Instead, he accepted that this was a blasphemy to the point that he accepted death on the cross. How would you uh, respond to that? So your question is, why did the high priest say blasphemy? Yeah, and why didn't Jesus argue that, yeah, uh, why didn't Jesus argue that, you're right, I'm not being blasphemous. He accepted that, yes, he was being blasphemous because he remained quiet and accepted death on the cross. So how would you respond to that? Because right. you said that he wasn't claiming to be blasphemous. Right. You see, the reason the high priest said blasphemy was not because Jesus made a blasphemous claim of being God, etc., as James D.G. Dunn in his book, Parting of the Ways, points out, it was more political in nature. By Jesus claiming to be the Messiah, not claiming to be God, what's it called, the high priest and all that thought he was a false Messiah and that he's going to bring um, wrath upon the Jewish nation. By claiming to be the Messiah, he's claiming to go directly against Rome. So for that reason, the high priest and the Jews in that trial were out to get Jesus. So they said blasphemy and they just tried to crucify him to get rid of him. But none of Jesus' claim there to be the Messiah was that I'm divine or something. He just made a claim that I'm the Messiah, that's all. So the blasphemy was for political reasons, not for um, religious reasons. Mr. Right, I mean, call me a traditionalist, but I, I think the priest accused him of blasphemy because he thought what Jesus had said uh, was blasphemous. And I ex explained the reasons why obviously a Jew would interpret that um, in that way. Now, why did Jesus accept the charge? Well, I think, again, if, if you've got an understanding of the whole theme of the New Testament, is that Jesus' mission included to come and to die as an atoning sacrifice. So Jesus wasn't trying to get out of being killed against his will. Again, it's missing the big picture, missing the main themes of the New Testament, its central teachings, and focusing on trivial peripheral nitpicking uh, to try and undermine its, its credibility. Thank you. Next, next question, please. Um, firstly, can I just thank Mr. Hussain again for bothering to travel all the way to Birmingham to debate with us. It's really very good of you. Um, I'd just like to revisit Isaiah 53 again, and this issue again that you know, Allah somehow made it appear that Jesus died, but he didn't actually die. Um, Isaiah 53, which I think you can clearly apply to the life of Christ, says in verse 5, you know, he was pierced for our transgressions. It talks about the physical injuries to Christ. And then in verse... Um, 
verse 9, it talks about, you know, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in death. And again, you know, you don't bury the dead. My question is, why, why is this revelation in the Old Testament not warning us that it's actually going to be an appearance? Why is the Old Testament so clearly sounding that Jesus will in fact die if that's not the case? You see, the problem is with the Christian interpretation of the Old Testament. For example, you quoted Isaiah 53. Nowhere in Isaiah 53 is the word Messiah there, yet Christians claim it's talking about the Messiah. So they say, oh, the, Isaiah 53 says the Messiah is going to die. But then when I quote Psalms chapter 20, which explicitly says that the Messiah will pray to God to be saved and I shall hear my un Messiah, they translate it anointed, and shall save him. And then we go to Matthew chapter 20, uh, 26 and Jesus prays to be saved from the cross. No Christian wants to pay attention to that. So Isaiah 53 can't be talking about the Messiah because Isaiah 53 says this person will see his seed. The Hebrew word is zera, which means physical seed. Now, does any Christian here believe Jesus had physical offspring? Can you put your hand up, please? Sorry, let, can we... So there's no Christian who put their hand up. So since you all admit Jesus didn't have seed, he cannot be the person of Isaiah chapter 53. And P.S., there's no word seeds in the Old Testament. It's always seed. It's a collective noun. Okay, my, my reply to that, I was making notes, getting ready to reply to that point. And I decided I'm not going to reply to that point. I'm going to stay, take a step back and remind you of something I said earlier on. I said, I expect Zakir tonight. I don't expect he's going to try and convince us that the Quran is a revelation from God. I mean, all he's offered is this vague prophecy from New Deuteronomy. I said, one of the things Zakir is going to focus on is undermining the New Testament. And the debate tonight, the vast majority of it, is the sort of nitpicking criticism of the New Testament to undermine it. I don't think we've heard a positive case from Zakir. What Zakir believes about Jesus is exactly what the Quran teaches. The things the Quran says he believes, the things that um, the Quran says that contradict the New Testament he believes. But Zakir is not trying to defend his own view. All he's doing is sort of slinging mud at the New Testament, attacking the New Testament again and again and again and again and again. So I'd like to invite Zakir. Can he give us any reason better than a prophecy in Deuteronomy that doesn't mention the, can the Quran, doesn't mention Muhammad, and is really clutching at straws? Is there any other reason why we should accept the Quran as, as God's words <laughs> to overrule the uh, eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life? I will allow Mr. St. Thomas, yeah. then, please. You see, what Richard doesn't understand is, I, the topic tonight is who was Jesus. I don't have to spend 20, uh, out of 20 minutes, 10 minutes trying to prove the Quran is the word of God, because tomorrow we're debating Islam or Christianity, which is a true faith. That's when you should be asking me to bring up my proof, not today. But notice he says, oh, uh, Deuteronomy 18, he's playing it down. But so far, Richard hasn't refuted it, yet nearly everything he's brought up, Isaiah 53, Daniel chapter 7, Isaiah 9, I refuted it. So why can't you refute um, Deuteronomy 18 if it's such a vague prophecy that doesn't mention Arabs or the Quran? So uh, uh, I think it's you clutching at straws and not getting to the point. Uh, so please answer this question. Deuteronomy 18 says it has to be from the brethren of the Israelites. Deuteronomy 34 denies um, an Israelite can be like Moses. Please answer that contradiction. Okay, uh, but Deuteronomy 18, 18, just to, to clarify, I can't remember it word for word, um, but it basically says a prophet will arise among you like Moses from among your brothers. It says something like that. Okay? Now, I'm just going to leave it to you to make your, your judgment whether that is a clear prophecy about Muhammad and the Quran or whether it's not. I don't need to say anything else. I'll leave that with you to make up your own mind. Thank you. Next question, please. Does Zakir believe that the Bible is God's word? Do I believe that the Bible is God's word? The Muslim position on it, in it is that uh, previous nations had been given scriptures, Moses was given the Torah, etc. Jesus was given the gospel, and that's what he preached. We believe the Bible contains remnants of this, but not all of it is pure and pristine. We believe people changed um, God's word around. For example, Surah 5, Ayah 13 says, they changed the words from the right places. And you can recall when I, um, I showed how Matthew changed Mark, etc. So we believe that there is truth in the Bible, but not all of it is true. The Jews and Christians corrupted their scriptures. Okay, thank you. What we're going to do now is we're going to have one final comment from Mr. Lucas. We're then going to give each speaker a couple of minutes to prepare their closing statements um, for the debate wraps up. Right, just to, um, to complete what Zakir was saying, Zakir was explaining quite, quite rightly that as Muslims believe uh, that some parts of the Bible, the New Testament and the um, Old Testament are indeed revelation from God, but some parts have been tampered with and are not reliable. 
how do you think Muslims decide which are which? The bits that agree with the Quran are the bits that are reliable. The bits that don't agree with the Quran, then you've got to try and trawl through the scholarship and find any means you can to undermine confidence <coughs> in it. So again, Zakia's beliefs are founded on the Quran, but he hasn't defended it at all. He's just attacking the Bible. Zakia's got some beliefs about uh, Jesus that are very distinct. You know, virgin birth, uh, sinless, uh, etc. These are really distinct supernatural beliefs about Jesus, and he hasn't tried to defend the source of them. I mean, he said about a, a debate tomorrow night. I mean, he's here trying to defend the Muslim view of Jesus, which is based on God's revelation in the Quran, and then he just hasn't done it. Can I respond to it? Um, we are now going to break for a couple of minutes so you guys can prepare your final speech. You're welcome to put whatever you like into your closing statement. As both How long is it? The closing statements are two minutes of length. Okay, so if people want to talk amongst themselves, we'll give the speakers time to prepare their closing statements. How long is the closing statements? Uh, we'll have the closing statements at 25 past. Oh, five four or five minutes, minutes to build in what you want. <coughs> okay, thank you. Both speakers are now ready to make their closing statements. So I would now like to welcome Richard Lucas to the lectern to make his final contribution tonight. Thank you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the debate and found it interesting and, uh, uh, and enlightening. Um, I haven't got much new to say. To conclude, I just want to, again, to re-emphasize things that I've already said on, on several occasions to draw things together. What I've been saying tonight is that in the New Testament, we've got accounts that were formalized shortly after Jesus' life on earth among his circle of friends and family, and they're based on, if not written by, um, eyewitnesses. Now, Zacchaeus has been throwing out New Testament problems uh, thick and fast, but if you look at the big picture of the Gospels, the big picture is agreement. They're writing about the same person. They're telling the same sort of stories about him. They're relaying the same sort of teaching about him. And they present the picture that I said about Jesus being divine, being in some way God on earth. Now, I'd just like to go back um, to the quote I read from, from Bart Ehrman, the very skeptical scholar. Because the key has been saying... Again, the early Gospels didn't really show that Jesus was divine. It only came in later. But just to read again the central part of the quote. These Gospels do indeed think of Jesus as divine, being made the very Son of God. So I think that is my conclusion as well, looking at the Gospels, is they don't present different pictures of Jesus. They present the same picture, and it's the one that Christians uh, believe in. There have been controversies in subsequent centuries, but my beliefs of a Christian, as a Christian are not based on councils in later centuries. They're based on the New Testament, and they're entirely consistent with the teaching of the, of the New Testament. Now, Zakiah has claimed that the Quran, written 600 years later, uh, with a confused and contradictory mix of gospel stories, Jewish fables, and uh, obviously it in attempts to bring Islamic theology to Jesus' lips and to the disciples, has no historical cred credibility, and therefore, I don't see any reason to trust it. Now, despite me repeatedly inviting Zakia to make a positive case why we should regard the Quran as a revelation from God, all we've had is the vague um, prophecy from Deuteronomy 18, which I'm sure anyone open mind, open, with an open mind would agree can't be taken as any strong evidence that the Quran is a revelation from God. Final sentence. God reached out to the human race, not just by sending a book, but by entering into it in human form in the person of Jesus, opening the way for us to know God in our lives now and forever. And I'm really grateful for that message that's changed my life, and it's the message I find in the New Testament where I find the real Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> Hello once again, everybody. The first point I'd like to say is that um, Richard keeps saying I brought up the vague prophecy of Deuteronomy 18, yet Richard couldn't refute it, whereas Isaiah 53, Isaiah 9, 6, and, um, or Daniel 7 were all refuted. He said that um, Bart Ehrman basically said that all the Gospels teach that Jesus is divine, 
But Bart Ehrman himself believes that the disciples and his mother and the people who actually knew Jesus didn't believe Jesus was God. Bart Ehrman is saying that the anonymous Gospels and Mark teach that Jesus is divine in some way. Same way Jews see Moses divine and they see Enoch divine. So it doesn't go with what you believe. Bart Ehrman believes that John um, brings a bigger picture, a bigger image of Jesus as God Almighty. He said that there's um, historical issues in the Quran, etc. I responded to some of them, but he can bring them all up tomorrow on that, and I'll respond to as many as I can. I brought up issues in the New Testament, and um, uh, Richard never gave me hardly any answers. Like, for example, he says um, the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, but I challenged him, show me the sentence in the Old Testament that says he will be called a Nazarene. I said that three times. I never heard a response once. He never answered the question, why did Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, who's supposed to be God, say that only the Father knows the hour? That means the Holy Spirit is ignorant and so is God the Son. Why did, Je why did Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 28, the Father is greater than I? Why did Jesus in John chapter 17, verse number 3, call the Father one person, the only true God? That is actually a heresy according to the um, Trinity. So if you're saying that um, you believe a Trinity, then Jesus would be classed as a heretic uh, when it comes to the Trinity because he called one person the only true God. So tonight we've seen that the Quran made claims about Jesus and you can't dispute many of them. Jesus was a human prophet. No Christian denies that. He was the Messiah for Israel. No Christian denies that. He did miracles. He was born of a virgin. Also, I mentioned that Jesus... God granted Jesus a miracle to defend his mother from the cradle, according to the Quran. Now Richard tried to say, oh, that's fiction, but he never answered my question. If that miracle was not done, why wasn't Mary stoned to death for blasphemy when she lived in, Jeru um, in the Jewish society, who according to their law would, would um, stone a fornicator to death? So the Quran answers that, the Bible doesn't. Thank you very much. Many thanks to both our speakers and to Edinburgh Lim Church tonight. I believe the discussion is going to continue out in the foyer, so I hope some people can take part in that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.